pretty much every organic chemistry one course reaches a point where there's a concrete transition from structure to reactivity. And the two are related, and we're going to refer back to structural concepts we've already developed over and over again as we get into organic reactions. But this is really the point in our course where we're moving from structure to reactivity. We're going to start talking about chemical change in the context of organic compounds. And chemical change when it comes to organic chemistry can be more complicated than probably what you've seen before with respect to reactions like precipitation and even the proton transfer reactions that we've talked about a little bit to this point. So what we're going to do in this unit is establish some foundational concepts and skills, give you some really general ideas that are going to apply throughout your study of organic chemistry, both in organic chemistry 1 and in organic chemistry 2, that we're going to refer to again and again and again. And these general principles will help you understand and interpret organic reactions and mechanisms and make predictions and explanations about how organic reactions proceed and why they proceed the way they do. So first we're actually going to roll the clock back to some foundational ideas about chemical thermodynamics, applying the first and second laws of thermodynamics to organic reactions and just revisiting what these are. We're also going to revisit chemical kinetics, look at the foundations there, rate laws, activation energy, the Arrhenius relationship, that kind of thing. We're going to look at a particular representation of the energetic progress of a reaction called a reaction coordinate diagram, which you may have seen in your introductory course. Reaction coordinate diagrams for organic reactions tend to be multi-step, and we often use them to compare the energetic pathways of related reactions. You'll also hear these referred to as energy profile diagrams in a number of sources. Now, when it comes to ionic or polar organic reactions involving ionic intermediates, it's all about nucleophiles and electrophiles. It's all about Lewis acids and Lewis bases. Lewis acids are electrophiles, Lewis bases nucleophiles. So we're going to learn what makes a molecule nucleophilic or electrophilic and how to recognize nucleophilic and electrophilic centers within organic structures. We'll also learn a formalism for depicting the movements of electron pairs in polar organic reactions, the curved arrow formalism. And we have experience with this in a bookkeeping sense from resonance already, but what we're going to start doing is using curved arrows to show chemical change. Now, curved arrows can get very visually complicated very quickly. The good news is we can make sense of what we're looking at if we realize that the number of legal moves, the number of moves we're allowed to make with curved arrows is limited. And everyone understands this. And so in your textbook and other resources where you're looking at organic reaction mechanisms, every step can be put into a limited number of boxes. And you want to learn how to see and classify different elementary steps of organic reaction mechanisms. So we're going to lay out about 10 by the time you get to the end of organic chemistry 2. In organic chemistry 1, we're going to focus on about maybe 5 to 7 elementary steps of ionic organic reaction mechanisms. And these are the legal moves, the things you're allowed to do in an elementary step in organic mechanism. Now, each step can be associated with, for example, an equilibrium constant and a delta G, a change in free energy. So we can talk about steps that are irreversible and complete in the forward direction, or steps that are reversible with a K value, an equilibrium constant close to 1. And we represent those differently using reaction arrows that are either reversible, showing the forward and reverse directions, or irreversible, showing just the forward direction. So we'll look at those conventions and talk a little bit how we think through whether a step is reversible or irreversible at the end of this unit. Let's start with the first law of thermodynamics and an important concept that comes out of the first law, enthalpy. Enthalpy is equal to the internal energy of a chemical system plus the product of its pressure and volume. And for organic chemistry, it's most helpful, I think, to think about enthalpy as being in the bonds and intermolecular forces of a substance or mixture in the sense that when we make or break a bond, enthalpy changes. The more bonds we have, the lower the enthalpy of the system. The fewer bonds we have, the higher the enthalpy of the system. And we have these terms that refer to changes in enthalpy, for example, during a phase change or a chemical reaction. Endothermic processes have a positive enthalpy change with enthalpy increasing. If we apply this idea about bonds, Make it being made or, or broken, 
endothermic processes correspond to breaking bonds or intermolecular forces generally. Things like evaporation or cleavage of a bond are endothermic in general. Whereas exothermic processes in which enthalpy is released or enthalpy goes down correspond to the making of bonds or intermolecular forces. Condensation, formation of a bond between centers, these tend to be exothermic processes. And exothermic processes tend to be spontaneous, but not always. Entropy in the second law, as we'll see, also plays a role. We can actually estimate the enthalpy change of a reaction by listing the bonds made and broken in the reaction and subtracting the bond dissociation energy of the bonds broken from the bond dissociation energy of the bonds made. Now, what is bond dissociation energy? energy or bond dissociation enthalpy. You'll hear me just use the term BDE. BDE is the energy required to break a bond homolytically with one electron of the bond going to each of the atoms involved, forming two radicals, X and Y, like you see on this slide. And if we use the idea of Hess's law, that enthalpy is a state function, and the notion that we can think of any reaction as breaking a bunch of bonds and then putting together a bunch of new bonds, we can use BDEs to predict the enthalpy change of a reaction as the bonds broken minus the bonds made. So bonds broken, that's an endothermic process, so these will be positive contributions to the delta H. And when bonds are made, that's a negative contribution to the delta H. So for example, in this table, we see bond dissociation energies listed as positive values because that's the energy input required to break the bond. But when those bonds are made, we get that amount of enthalpy back as a negative contribution to the delta H. Of course, enthalpy is only half the story when it comes to chemical thermodynamics. We know, for example, that there are some endothermic processes that are nonetheless spontaneous. And to explain that, we need to account for the second law of thermodynamics, that spontaneous processes result in an increase in the entropy of the universe. And entropy is this measure of energy dispersal, randomness, or disorder in a system that gives a sense of the likelihood of a particular macroscopic state. Generally, the higher the entropy, the more likely a given macroscopic state is to exist. Now, in the context of reactions from introductory chemistry, you may be familiar with this idea that higher entropy is generally associated with the gas phase, with more dispersed phases in general, with a larger number of molecules, with a greater mass, that kind of thing. In organic chemistry, we can also relate entropy to the nature of the molecular structure and things like the number of vibrational and rotational degrees of freedom that a molecule has. And so, for example, here, we're familiar with this idea probably from introductory chemistry, that if we go from one mole of reactant to two moles of products, that corresponds to a positive entropy change. Since we have more molecules, energy is dispersed over more different types of molecules on the product side than the reactant side. But we also have an increase in entropy in this case. And the reason is, we go from a relatively rigid, relatively conformationally constrained, strictly cyclic structure to a relatively flexible, flappy, acyclic structure that can occupy a variety of different conformations. So the conformational energy of the molecule, we might say, is spread out over multiple different conformations in the acyclic structure relative to the cyclic structure, and this makes the acyclic structure a higher entropy situation. So things like opening a ring, breaking one molecule into two or more. These are associated with positive changes in entropy. And again, because entropy is a state function, going the opposite direction corresponds to a decrease in entropy. If we go from two molecules to one, that's a decrease in entropy. If we go from an acyclic structure to a cyclic structure and close a ring, that too corresponds to a decrease in entropy. We can put the ideas of enthalpy and entropy together in what's called the Gibbs free energy. This is the net energy available for a spontaneous process to do work in accordance with the second law of thermodynamics. So the change in free energy, delta G, is delta H minus T delta S, where here the little circle means from standard conditions. Now, we can also talk, like we talked about exothermic and endothermic, we can talk about the sign of the free energy change. Exergonic processes have a negative free energy change, and on a reaction coordinate diagram, we can recognize those because the reactants are at a higher energy than the products. So this is an exergonic process in this diagram on the left. 
Processes that involve an increase in free energy are called endergonic, and we see an example of that on the right-hand side with the reactants lower in energy than the products. So delta G is positive. That's an endergonic process. So any process with negative delta G, and I'm realizing this should say exergonic, not endergonic, any exergonic process is spontaneous, and any endergonic process is non-spontaneous. How these free energy changes and enthalpy and entropy changes relate to the amounts of actual molecules in a chemical system is really captured in the equilibrium constant. And this is a value that reflects the extent to which a reaction favors the products or reactants at chemical equilibrium. So we know from introductory chemistry that K is equal to this reaction quotient, the concentration of concentrations of products divided by the concentrations of reactants at equilibrium, and that quotient more generally gets the symbol Q. So K can be thought of as the value of Q at chemical equilibrium. And K depends exponentially on the standard free energy change delta G naught through a relationship like this. This is the mathematical form of that relationship. Now, the math is not so important for us. What's important here is the intuition. When delta G is negative, that means the natural log of K must be positive, meaning K must be greater than 1. This indicates a product favored process. So for example, here we see with this negative delta G, this is going, going to correspond to a process in which C and D are favored over A and B thermodynamically. The other side of the coin is if the free energy change is positive, well then K is less than 1 and the reactants are favored. On a reaction coordinate diagram, the intuition here is the lower energy side is the favored side. You can imagine for an end endergonic process, the reactants and products would be flipped here energetically and the reactants would be lower in energy than the products. In this particular case, as we have it drawn, the products are favored over the reactants, and the way we can represent that is by drawing an arrow, a reaction arrow pointed toward the product side. If K is not too large, you may also see a smaller reverse arrow indicating that the reverse reaction occurs to a degree that cannot be ignored, but that the product side is still favored. So this kind of reversible arrow you'll see regularly in organic reaction schemes and mechanisms. Conceptually, chemical equilibrium corresponds to a point of minimum free energy. Once the system's at equilibrium, it has no capacity to do useful work. The free energy of the chemical system is, is minimized at this point. And this point may lie either on the reactant or product side, depending on the value of K and the sign of delta G. And this figure from Klein really does a great job of illustrating this, I think. So, what we have here is the dependence of the free energy on the composition of a reaction mixture with A plus B going to C plus D. And we've got the minimum value of G right here, and this corresponds to chemical equilibrium, the point at which Q equals K. The standard free energy change, delta G naught, is the difference in free energy between this point and the point on the curve where Q is equal to 1, which corresponds to standard state conditions. Let's just say that lies right here, kind of halfway from only A and B to only C and D, right in the middle, right? At this point, we can identify the free energy right there and recognize that delta G naught is the difference in energy between these two points. This is a point you'll dig into quantitatively and look at in more detail in a more advanced physical chemistry course, Chem 31, uh, 3411 at Georgia Tech specifically. And this delta G is clearly negative then. If we think about starting here and going here, we've got a negative change in free energy. So this is an exergonic process. And notice also that the equilibrium point on the x-axis lies on the product side of Q equals 1, indicating that this reaction is favored in the forward direction. So all this we can infer from this graph of how the free energy varies with the composition of the reaction mixture. This is not a plot that you'll see again in any organic chemistry course. In fact, you won't see it again until you study physical chemistry. But I love it conceptually because it really makes the point that what delta G naught is telling you is the difference in free energy from the standard state 
to the equilibrium state. And that for an exergonic process, one that is spontaneous, we're going to move in this direction spontaneously toward the product side, right, towards pure product, until we hit that equilibrium point. And that equilibrium point will never lie all the way to the right, but it might be 99.999% C plus D with only 0.00001% of A and B. And so we can talk about complete reactions, which are basically that 99% plus, or reversible reactions, something like this, where we're going to have a good amount of A plus B left and a good amount of back reaction occurring at chemical equilibrium.